Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu Alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making such videos for you. Start of Chapter 2 Science and the Quranic Revelations Ungrudging Tributes Today, there are in the world some 1,000 million Muslims who unhesitatingly accept that the Holy Quran is the Word of God and that it is a miracle. Why should they not, when even avowed enemies are paying unsolicited tributes regarding the miraculous nature of this book of God? Rev. R. Bosworth Smith in his book Muhammad and Muhammadanism opines about the Quran. A. A miracle of purity of style, of wisdom and of truth. Another Englishman, A. J. R. Berry, in the preface of his English translation of the Quran says, B. Whenever I hear the Quran chanted, it is as though I am listening to music. Underneath the flowing melody, there is a sounding all the time the insistent beat of a drum. It is like the beating of my heart. From these words and the rest of his preface, he sounds like a Muslim. But regretfully, he died outside the pale of Islam. And yet another Briton, Marmaduke Pictol, in the foreword to his translation of the Holy Quran, describes it as, See, that inimitable symphony the very sound of which move men to tears and ecstasy. This author embraced Islam before translating the Qur'an, and we are not in a position to verify whether he wrote the previous effect before or after his conversion. d. Next to the Bible, it, the Qur'an, is the most esteemed and most powerful religious book in the world. J. Christie Wilson in Introducing Islam New York, 1950. E. The Quran is the Muhammadan Bible and is more reverenced than any other sacred book, more than the Jewish Old Testament or the Christian New Testament. J. Shilidi D. D. In The Lord Jesus in the Quran, Surat 1913, page 111. We can quite easily adduce a dozen more eulogies to the above list. Friends and foes alike paying ungrudging commendations to the last and final revelation of God, the Holy Quran. The contemporaries of Muhammad wasallam, saw in its beauty and majesty the nobility of its call and the magnanimity of its message, the sign and miracle of God's handiwork, and accepted Islam. To all the tributes and testimonies, the unbeliever and the skeptic may say, that these are all subjective feelings. He might further seek refuge in the pretext that he does not know Arabic. He is heard to say, I do not see what you see, nor do I feel as you feel. How am I to know that God exists and that it is he who inspired his messenger Muhammad with that beautiful message, the Quran? He continues, I am not averse to the beauty of its philosophy, its practical ethics and high morality. I am prepared to concede that Muhammad وسلم, was a sincere man and that he gave many beautiful precepts for human welfare. What I cannot subscribe to is what you Muslims claim, a supernatural authority for his dicta. Reasoned Logic To this kind of sympathetic yet skeptical mentality, the author of the book Al-Qur'an uses various types of arguments to resolve his doubts. To the atheists and agnostics, the cynics and the skeptics, who have a superabundance of scientific knowledge and who consider themselves to be intellectual giants, the point is driven home that they are in reality like stunted dwarfs. They are like the dwarf who may have acquired abnormal development in any one particular direction at the expense of other parts of his faculty. Like an oversized head on a puny body, the Supreme Creator questions him. But before we pose God's question to him, let me satisfy my own curiosity. You men of science who have studied astronomy 
and who study our universe through your mighty telescopes as if it's scrutinizing an object in the palm of your hand. Tell me, how did this universe come into being? This man of science, though lacking in spiritual insight, is nevertheless most generous in sharing his knowledge. He readily responds, well, he begins, billions of years ago our universe was a single piece of matter, and there happened a big bang in the center of that huge lump of matter and mighty chunks of matter began flying in all directions. Out of that big bang, our solar system came into being as well as the galaxies. And since there is no resistance in space to that primordial momentum generated by the initial explosion, the stars and the planets swim along in their orbits. At this juncture, my memory tickles me. Our materialist friends appear to have been secretly imbibing their knowledge from the Surah Yasin. Washam Sutajri, and the sun runs his course. Limustaqarrillaha, for a period determined for him. Zalika taqdeerul azizil alim. That is the decree of him, the exalted in might, the all-knowing. Walqamara qaddarnahu manazila. And the moon, we have measured for her mansions to traverse. Hatta aadaka al-urjoon al-qadim. Till she returns like the old and withered lower part of a date stock. La shamsu yanbaghi laha an tudrika al-qamar. It is not permitted to the sun to overtake the moon. وَلَلَّيْلُ سَابِقُ النَّهَارِ Nor can the night outstrip the day. وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ Each just swims along in its own orbit according to law. Holy Qur'an, Surah Yasin, Chapter 36, Verses 38-40 to 40. The atheistic scientist continues, Ours is an expanding universe. The galaxies are receding away from us at a faster and faster rate, and once they reach the speed of light, we will not be able to see them anymore. We must construct bigger and better telescopes as quickly as possible to study the sights. If not, we will miss the bus. When did you discover these fairy tales? We ask. No, these are not fairy tales, but scientific facts. Our friend assures us. All right. We accept your facts for what you say they are. But when did you really stumble upon these facts? Only yesterday, he replies. Fifty years after all is only yesterday in the history of the human race. An unlettered Arab in the desert over 1400 years ago could never have had your knowledge of the Big Bang and of your expanding universe. Could he? We ask. No, never. He retorts postingly. Well, then listen to what this Umni prophet uttered under inspiration. Awalam yaralazina kafaru. Do not the unbelievers, the atheists, and the agnostics see, anna sama wati wal art, that the heavens and the earth, kana taratpan fafatakna huma, were joined together as one unit of creation before we clove them asunder. Holy Qur'an, Surah Anbiya, Chapter 21, Verse 30 والنهار, And it is He, God Almighty, who created the night and the day, والقمر, and the sun and the moon, كُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ All the celestial bodies swim along, each in its rounded course. Holy Qur'an, Surah Anbiya, Chapter 21, verse 33 Big Bang Theory Can't you see that the words the unbelievers in the first quote above are specially addressed to you, the men of science, the geographers, the astronomers, who after having made amazing discoveries and conveyed these discoveries to mankind, still remain so blind as not to see its author with our sciences and encyclopedias? We are apt to forget the divineness in those laboratories of ours, says Thomas Carlyle. Where on earth could a camel driver in the desert have gleaned your facts 1400 years ago, except from the maker of the Big Bang himself? Origin of life. And you biologists, 
who seem to have your fingers on all organic life and yet have the temerity to deny the existence of the source of that life, that is God. Tell me, according to your wanted research, where and how did life originate? Like his unbelieving astronomer companion in science, he too begins. Well, billions of years ago, primeval matter in the sea began to generate protoplasm, out of which came the amoeba, and out of that mire in the sea came all living things. In one word, all life came from the sea, that is, water. And when did you discover this fact, that all living things came from water? The answer is no different from that of his fellow scientist, the astronomer. Yesterday, no man of learning, no philosopher or poet could ever have guessed your biological discovery 14 centuries back. Could he? We ask. And our biologist is as emphatic as the astronomer. No, never, says he. Well then, you just listen to this untutored son of the desert. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيِّ And we made from the water every living thing. أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Will they, the unbelievers, the atheists and the agnostics, then not believe? Holy Qur'an, Surah Anbiya, Chapter 21, Verse 30 the above statement is further elaborated in the Book of God. Wallahu khalaqa kulla ta'ibatin mimma. And Allah has created every animal from water. Faminhum man yamshi ala batni. Of them, there are some that creep on their bellies. Faminhum man yamshi ala rijlain. Some that walk on two legs. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَىٰ أَرْبَعَ And some that walk on four. يَخْلُقُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ Allah creates what He wills. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ For verily, Allah has power over all things. Holy Qur'an, Surah Nur, Chapter 24, Verse 45 It will not be difficult for you to note that these words of the omnipotent, omniscient creator of the universe were addressed to you, men of knowledge, in answer to your skepticism today. Their real import was beyond the dwellers of the desert 14 centuries ago. The author, God Almighty, is reasoning with you, you men of science. How can you not believe in God? You should be the last to deny his existence, and yet you are the first. What sickness has overtaken you? that you allow your egos to overshadow your sense of logic? And to the botanists and the zoologists and the physicists who, despite their amazing insight into the nature of things, refuse to acknowledge a master creator. Let them then account for these utterances of Muhammad وسلم, the mouthpiece of God. Subhan al-Lazi Glory be to him God Almighty, خلق الأزواج كلها, who created in pairs all things, مما تمرت الأرض, that which the earth produces, the vegetable kingdom, ومن أنفسهم, as well as their own humankind, the animal kingdom, ومما لا يعلمون, and other things of which they have no knowledge, like of physics, Holy Quran. Surah Yasin, chapter 36, verse 36. Created in pairs, the mystery of sex runs through all creation, in man, in animal life, in vegetable life, and in other things of which we have no knowledge. Then there are pairs of opposite forces in nature, example positive and negative electricity, etc. The atom itself consists of a positively charged nucleus or proton surrounded by negatively charged electrons. The constitution of matter itself is thus referred to as pairs of opposite energies. Common by A. Yusuf Ali Signs of God The verses of this prospicious book, the Holy Qur'an, are evidently self-explanatory. Students of the Qur'an saw the unmistakable finger of God in every discovery that man made. These were the signs, 
the miracles from his beneficent Lord and cherish her so as to remove his doubts and strengthen his faith. In these are signs for a people of learning. Holy Quran, Surah Rum, Chapter 30, Verse 22 What an irony! It is the people of learning who are actually rebellious. Their vast material knowledge has inflated them with pride. They lack the genuine humility which goes together with all true knowledge. In the words of a modern Frenchman, the above observation, his own thesis, makes the hypothesis advanced by those who see Muhammad as the author of the Quran untenable. How could a man from being illiterate become the most important author in terms of literary merits in the whole of Arabic literature? How could he then pronounce truths of a scientific nature that no other human being could possibly have developed at that time, and all this without once making the slightest error in his pronouncement or the subject? See the Bible, the Quran and Science, page 125 by Maurice Bukai. Early Inspiration The seeds of this booklet, Al-Quran, the Miracle of Miracles, was probably sown by the roving ambassador of Islam, the silver-tongued orator, Molana Abdullah Alim Siddiqui. I was only a schoolboy when he visited South Africa on a lecture tour in 1935. Among his many erudite speeches, I heard him talk on cultivation of science by the Muslims. Subsequently, a booklet under the same title was published by the World Federation of Islamic Missions, Karachi, Pakistan, which brings back the earlier joy and thrill of the discourse I heard in my teens. In memory of that great servant of Islam, I reproduce here for posterity a few words of what the Maulana had to say on the relationship between the Holy Quran and the branches of scientific knowledge. Exhortations to the Sciences the stress which the Holy Qur'an has laid on the scientific study of the universe is a phenomenon unique in the religious literature of the world. Repeatedly it calls our attention to the multifarious phenomena of nature occurring around us. Repeatedly it exhorts the Muslims that the pursuit of scientific knowledge is one of their religious duties. Repeatedly it emphasizes the greater truth unknown to the pre-Qur'anic world that everything in nature is for the service of man and should be harnessed by him for his use. It exhorts us to study the structure and function of the human organism, the structure, functions and distribution of animals, the form, structure, functions, classification and distribution of plants, and these are problems of biology. It exhorts us to study the order of nature and the general properties of matter as affected by energy, which is the problem of modern physics. It exhausts us to study the properties of substances, both elementary and compound, and the laws of their combination and action one upon another, which is the problem of modern chemistry. It exhausts us to study the structure and mineral constitution of the globe, the different strata of which it is composed, the changes that take place in its organic and inorganic matter, etc., etc., which are the problem of modern geology. It exhausts us to study the general description of the earth, its physical divisions into seas, rivers, mountains, plains, etc., and the minerals, plants and animals in each, and its political divisions, which are the problems of modern geography. It exhausts us to study the causes which bring about the alternation of day and night, the variation of the seasons, the movement of the planets and other celestial phenomena, which are the problems of modern astronomy. It exhausts us to study the movements of winds, the formation and evolution of clouds, and the production of rain, and other similar phenomena, which are the problems of modern meteorology. For centuries, Muslims were world leaders in the field of scientific learning. Then slowly, the leadership began to slip away from their hands. Muslims had failed in their leadership role. 
and materialistic Europe move forward to fill the vacuum in leadership created by the Muslims. Further, the Molana records the contribution made by the Muslims as follows. The intellectual upheaval created by Islam was a gigantic one. There is not a single department of learning which the Muslim scholars have left untouched and which they have not carved out a high position for themselves. In truth, Islam intends the Muslim community to be a community of intellectuals and the cultivation of science and all other forms of learning is one of the primary aims of Islam. Had it not been for the Muslims, Europe would never have seen its way to the Renaissance and the modern scientific era would never have dawned. Those nations who have received their knowledge of science from Europe are in fact indirectly the disciples of the Islamic community of the past. Humanity owes to Islam a debt which it can never repay and gratitude which it can never forget. A silver-tongued orator, the Molana ended his masterful exposition of the topic Cultivation of Science by the Muslims with the words, Before I conclude, let me affirm once more that the Muslim community is out and out a creation of Islam which in its turn is rooted in divine revelation. Nothing but belief in and the practice of Islam can make an individual a Muslim. Islam has laid it down as a religious duty that a Muslim should inquire into the reality of objects around him so that his scientific inquiry may lead him to the knowledge of his creator. Scientific inquiry in Islam is not an end but a means to the attainment of a higher end and this is really the true end of humanity. To Allah we belong and to Allah is our return. Holy Quran Chapter 2 Verse 156 My Aborted Lecture I had the privilege of hearing the above speech in 1934 from the lips of the Master himself. In the late thirties, I had the speech in my hands as a booklet. I memorized it with some changes and modifications, while still working in a Muslim shop at Adams Mission Station. I was so enthused that I made arrangements with Adams College to speak to the students and their lecturers on the same subject. At that time, I might not have fully grasped the enormity of my task. But I will never know for sure as my Muslim boss came to my rescue. He threatened me with dismissal if I did not cancel my first public lecture. I backed out. My employer was no doubt ignorant of Allah's warning. I too knew no better. I cannot say what stand I would have taken then if I was programmed with this admonition. Qul in kana aba'ukum Say, if it be your fathers, wa abna'ukum, or your sons, wa ikhwanukum, or your brothers, wa azwajukum wa ashiratukum, or your mates, or your relations, or the wealth that ye have amassed, or the losses ye fear in your business, or the dwellings in which you take delight, if you love any of these more than you love Allah, or His Messenger, what he had in fi sabilihi, or the striving in his cause. Fatarabbasu hatta yatizaha bi amri. Then wait until Allah brings about his decision. Wallahu la yahdil qawm al fasiqeen. And Allah guides not a rebellious people. Holy Quran, Surah Tawbah, Chapter 9, Verse 24. Thanks to our timid brother. My first ever lecture to Christian missionaries and trainee priests, which I had so assiduously planned, memorized, and rehearsed came to nothing. Perhaps I was set back ten years in my career in public speaking. There are millions like my Muslim boss who are just as terrified by material considerations enumerated in the above verse, who not only will not deliver the message of Islam themselves, but obstruct those prepared to do the job. 
Yet they display in their bearing the utmost piety to no avail. Allah describes such people as perverted transgressors. Take up the challenge. In the foregoing speech, the Maulana had drawn our attention to the Quranic exhortations for us to ponder on biology, physics, chemistry, geology, meteorology, etc. Scholars like Maurice Bukai, Keith Moore and Sheikh Zindani have written on different scientific aspects of the Holy Quran in recent times. But the scope is limitless. The Noble Quran is an ocean of knowledge. In this world of specialization, Muslim scientists must take up the challenges hinted at by the Molana in the mid-30s. They do not have to dabble in every field, to each his own particular speciality. The youth of Islam is hungry for information and articles, and small tracts on different scientific subjects in order to whet their appetites. Encyclopedias may follow, inshallah. I do not have to apologize for leaving the exposition of Quranic sciences to Muslim scientists. Even non-Muslims should be encouraged to explore the depths of wisdom as enshrined in the Book of God. For my part, as a layman, I will share with you the miraculous nature of the Holy Quran in what appears to me to be in simple, ordinary facts. End of chapter 2